Welcome to Fridays with Anne. This is a series of conversations with Belgian homeopath Anne Fafake about homeopathy. I will ask her curiously whatever confuses me in homeopathy, like case taking, case analysis, or theory in general. And Anne will answer according to her insights, experience, and most recent findings. You, the viewer, are invited to participate actively, so please feel free to send in comments and questions. For more information on Anne and her work, please follow these links, which will also be posted below every video. And now today's episode of Fridays with Anne. Here we are with another Friday. Hello, Anne. Hi, Jos. I'm very happy to speak to you today. And our topic will be case management. The last time we spoke a lot about um, evaluating the case, as in what happens, what, what are we expecting to happen when we give a similimum to the patient? And also when we thought we give a similimum, we see that it might just be a partial remedy. How can we tell this? And I thought since we were already focusing on this aspect of uh, case management, it would be a good uh, point in time to come back to this thing that you mentioned already way earlier in another episode that you would call a, a mythical remedy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this sounds quite mythical to me. So please shed some light on the, the whole on the whole myth. Okay, I'll do that. That's a very good question. Yeah, indeed, I think in the beginning of uh, our uh, uh, hangouts, I just refer to it like, I will explain later, okay, mm -hmm. and the time is now. According to me, it's what I observed, and I call it mythical, because, you know, you have to give a name to it. It's a prescription on the level, uh, on the mind level, level four, uh, mm -hmm. And there you have, as far as I can see, that's the level of the psyche, the mental level. And your psyche has uh, also three levels. It's divided in three levels. That's psychology, that's not homeopathy. It's uh -huh. uh, uh, your conscious level, your subconscious, and your unconscious. And so your conscious, that's easy. We all know that. That's where the patient speaks to us. I mean, I, I refer now to a consultation. The patient speaks to us from his rational mind. It's every time he says, I think, and I know, and I understand, and all that. All his thoughts about himself and his, uh, and his uh, state, and his situation, or whatever his problems are. For us, it's not very useful, but it tells us something. And this, this is mm -hmm. thinking a lot, is he intelligent, is he rationalizing his feelings, etc. And then you have this unconscious level, uh, the subconscious level, I'm sorry, where every, everything that is uh, unacceptable or too painful for us to feel uh, and to experience in a conscious way is like um, put under the carpet. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. there, but it's invisible. We don't see it. And in our daily life, it, um, it is not directly experienced, but it's always ready to pop up at any moment of uh, less um uh, control so we use it as a homeopath very often as a direct way or the like the, the stepping stone to the vital because it is um if it pops up it is more authentic more deep than like the, the controlling uh conscious mind so mm -hmm. that. it pops up in dreams it pops up in moments of uh, uh, extreme stress and when the patient loses control. So that's sometimes a good idea, that's why it's sometimes a good idea to ask for the most intense moments or the, the biggest, uh, the things with the biggest impact. We, we call it like this, we don't give it a particular name, but yeah. the patient will mostly um, come up with a story where he lost control or he was hurt the deepest or whatever. And also in his dreams, uh, those things will come up. But then we have another layer, uh, layer that I think, as far as I understand, is um, the unconscious where we, as humans, as individuals, 
take part in the story of humanity, like where our personal life um, has these experiences that, let's say, is common to humans. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, it's, if humanity would be one organism with its own biography and its own big events, as mm -hmm. a person, as an individual, we take part in this. But we mm -hmm. sometimes our own small individual life has these moments where we need to refer to these big stories, these big stories of humanity, these mythological events, in order to come to terms with it or to help us take a particular transition in our life. And we all have these transitions. Being born and die are the famous transitions we all go through. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, the first thing that the humans did was burying their dead. We're not like animals when, when somebody dies, when an individual dies, that we just walk on, you know? Like life goes on and the corpse is left by itself. We, we need a ritual to come to terms with ending this life and, and even, you know, as most of people on earth believe, going to the next, going to some other realm where our soul is continuing its journey. But we just can't go on with our life without a ritual. We need a ritual and we need to share this mm -hmm. in order to overcome this step, this transition, in the big transition in our life. And so yeah. we have many, many of those transitions, many, many of these bigger than my personal lifetime events. And all those things are symbolized in stories, in fairy tales, in um, mythology, allegories, symbols. That's why we have them everywhere. In so all is, <clears throat> is this aspect of the thing, is it uh, what Jung referred to as archetypes? Yeah, some, something like that. It's the oh, archetypal events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the Greek world of, of the gods, they all are like, let's say, bigger humans than the normal. But they, they are gods, but they're very human-like in their jealousy, in their violence, in their fights, in their whatever. Yeah. But it's like our projection mm -hmm. in, in the, like in, on a bigger screen. Yeah? And then we understand it with other than daily life words, that we partake in this. It's not something outside of us where we have nothing to do with, no. It's the same in, 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 in fairy tales, like the stories of Prim, you know, and, and you know, Little Red Riding, Riding Hood being eaten by the wolf. It is a mythological story. It's mm -hmm. not just a very creepy story to scare little children. Eh? And some parents hesitate to tell their children because they will be scared. But being scared as a child is it's part of a bigger story, you know. And being eaten yeah, is a mythological thing. Usually in life you don't get eaten, and yet the stories are full of it. And also in every story there's a prince that needs to go out in the, in the world on a quest, and then he has to, to, to fight a dragon, and, and find, find the treasure, and, and when, he, um, when he achieves, then the, the princess is his, you know. <laughs> and all those mythological stories, all this myth, that's why I call it the myth, we can have in our life and we can have a problem that we can't solve, a, mytho a mythological step, a transition in our life that we, we are unable to do. We, we, we don't know, we hesitate, we are unaware of it, or we have no solution. Yeah? You have to do something and you can't, for some reason you can't. Mm -hmm. You feel your circumstances don't allow you to. And then, what I think I see more than once, the body will produce like intense symptoms that seem to come out of the blue, that the person never had before. It's not in his constitution. It's not like I always have a sensitive skin and now I have a rash all over. No, he never, never, ever at any spot on his skin. Now he's 35 years old. 
and he has eczema all over. Where does it come from? Mm -hmm. Or any other problem that just seems to come out of the blue. There wasn't a tendency before. All the other circumstances in life and all the stresses didn't provoke this particular set of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Very intense. You can't be denied. It's not something you're going to live with because you have to move on in your life. You can't stand still. You cannot stay there forever. You can stay there for a few years. Yeah? But the symptoms will just urge you to find a solution. Yeah. And what I've seen, mostly they're absolutely therapy resistant. Uh -huh. <laughs> on top of that. <laughs> so they won't be suppressed. They don't let themselves be suppressed. This has to be solved. Uh -huh. And that would be my criteria for a mythical problem that asks for a mythical remedy, probably once in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first question that comes to mind then is how would you tell this apart or why yeah well, how would you tell this apart from uh, from the vital disturbance very good question apart from the apart from the what you just mentioned the physical symptom that it is a symptom that didn't show any tendency before very good question and your patient will make you think about it because he in a vital prescription, it's most likely to say, I always have this, have had this, I always felt like this, even as a child I was, uh -huh. no matter what age. Yeah? Uh, like the moment the person starts to generalize his problem, like from my problem he moves to me, mm -hmm. he will probably refer to the time, like always, I always been like this, I always been shy. You know, I've never been a hero, you know, I always was a, a mother's child, whatever. Whereas with a medical problem, you might say something like, I don't know where this came from, I never had it. Mm -hmm. It's like almost this is not me. And also, very often the patient will have a very specific moment in time when it started, and often he will make the link since I. And there's a very specific moment um, linked with a particular circumstance. And it could be since I moved to this country because I met uh, my husband and we moved, mm -hmm. I started having this problem. Or since I finished my study and then start to work and it's not, not exactly the work I've chosen to do. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Since my child is born, hmm, this and this started. Mm -hmm. it, but very often it is a matter of a problem, a conflict started, and the step couldn't be taken. <laughs> Necessary decision couldn't be made. Mm -hmm. There was no escape. A person saw no solution for this problem. They saw no. There was. There wasn't a decision to make because he couldn't. Yeah. That's how he got blocked. That's why the system is like calling out with the symptoms like, sorry, you can't stay here. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So there would be something which is um, aside the vital disturbance because um, in the vital disturbance we have similar things. A patient would tell us that this and that bothers them, has, has always bothered them, or produces them stress for this and that reason. Mm -hmm. um, but with this mythical, or mythical part, or yeah, part of it, um, it would mean that, yeah, basically that it's very different from what he has told before and that it's something new to not only to the therapist but also to the patient yes and even if you see the patient for the first time mm -hmm. then even then he can say it started at that moment and you, as a homeopath you will ask anything you had before like if a person said 
yeah, I don't know, I had this cough and I'm coughing for months and for months and, and I took this, that and the other and said, you've always been sensitive to me. I said, well, coughing, I never coughed in, cough in my life, you know, no mm -hmm. respiratory problems whatsoever. <laughs> mm -hmm. No allergies, no, I never was an allergic. So then you would think, isn't that strange? That a thing like that starts like later mm -hmm. in life when normally it's constitutional. It's mm -hmm. a thing that you very often see early in life. Mm -hmm. And then the patient would think it's strange, but you would think it's even more strange. <laughs> yeah. So when you spot this in a case, what do you do? Prescribe. <laughs> Prescribe. Prescribe. Yeah, and, and this remedy, that's what I actually, that's, that's the main thing. This remedy, I think, won't be needed a second time. Uh -huh. yeah. And why I came up with this idea is because I've seen cases where the interview, the anamnesis seemed to be curative, not only mm -hmm. it was like very convincing <laughs> curative. And then the question is, how come that in some cases you, know, you do a similar anamnesis as deep and as thorough and you know, and with the one patient is like almost a catharsis in itself, the patient becomes aware of the problem by only hearing himself talking actually. And his symptoms disappear like snow for the sun. And that's also typical with medical problems. When the problem is solved, the spell is broken. And very intense. As I told you, most of the time the symptoms are very intense. Very intense. Therapy-resistant symptoms disappear like snow for the sun, even within hours. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not what we see in a vital prescription. It mm -hmm. takes more time to build up the chronic problem and it takes more time to cure. While this mythical um, problem seems to come more or less sudden and disappear very quickly. So, mm -hmm. as I would say, of course prescribe, but in some cases it doesn't even seem to be necessary. And I think all those cases, you, I'm sure you've heard of, and all those homeopaths who say, who claim that the anamnesis in itself is healing. And I would say, yes, it's healing for different reasons. It's, when it's a vital prescription it's, or, or a vital problem, the reason why it's healing, and it's healing for everybody, I think, is to be heard, to be listened to, to be cared for, and to be not judged. And don't leave the room with good advices. That's a healing thing for everybody. <laughs> but you have a group of patients that it's more than that. From the moment on, from the intake on, mm -hmm. they start to get better. And they're better within hours, days, let's say, you know, the exceptions are weeks, and the problem will never recur again. It's gone for good. Mm -hmm. That also, for me, is a point that it was a medical problem after all. And you prescribe, or you can prescribe, if it's not cured by your um, anamnesis, because this is probably the reason why homeopaths claim awareness is cure. If you become aware of the medical problem, it's gone. It's gone by taking it from your unconscious to your conscious, then it's gone. That's why I say the spell is broken. And the spell can be broken by watching a movie, and all of a sudden, it's like mirroring your problem. You understand what the problem is, and it's gone, or the consultation is mirroring. And I think that is behind the idea that the homeopathic analysis should mirror a patient's problem. It shouldn't. But by nature, it does, because the patient hears himself talking for an hour to two hours. So, in all detail, he explains his problem. And that, in some cases, is enough to break the spell. If not, you prescribe the remedy, and then I wouldn't expect it to be needed after that. And then the patient is back in his vital state where he always was. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that this is to resolve an issue like this 
what happens in psychoanalysis? Possible, possibly, possibly. But it takes a few years and a lot of money, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you prescribe coming back to homeopath homeopathic therapy? Um, how do you prescribe that for this mythical stage? You take the picture of, of the mythical problem. It's like that is then your case. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's focus on this one thing. It started then. How did you feel? How did you react? How do you feel now? What what are your physical symptoms? You make the whole consultation around this thing, not who are you. See, that's a different focus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um so I suppose you had um experience like this where you then prescribe the remedy and then um, a mythical remedy and then the problem got solved and yeah and it happened to me well a few things came together it happened to me because as i prescribed then the received remedy the similar remedy, and the problem wasn't solved mm -hmm. then i had to look for reasons why and one of the reasons why is that i i could understand that it was on another level um and the other thing that uh, added to it was cases I've seen from other homeopaths with miraculous cures yeah, that I could understand, like solving the medical problem mm -hmm. with or without remedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is this a bit similar to a layer, so to say? Yeah, probably some homeopaths would call it a layer. Like, if the patient would say, I never had this before, I never had a problem with whatever the problem is. Let's say now he has a problem with his joints. I never had joint pain. I was a sporting person. And look at my knee now. I can't even move, you know. And, uh, and it's thick and swollen. And I tried everything and nothing else. Probably a lot of homeopaths would think, OK, you know, this knee problem is a layer. Mm -hmm. and take it away then the next layer will shine through and in a way it it, uh, it uh, overlaps or it looks similar like mm -hmm. our theory maybe only you know finding theoretical explanations for more or less the same observations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i wouldn't call it a layer because then what put the layer on it what provoked the layer and the, the medical problem somehow explains it for me like there is in the inside something that uh, an unsolvable problem so you need have to shout out do something about it you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you want to call it a layer for me it's fine mm -hmm. yeah 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 okay and you already touched a uh, touch upon this the uh, so obviously the mythical blockage is one thing that would keep a otherwise vital prescription from working yeah. and um, you mentioned it what what are other things that in your experience um, well what were other thoughts that you had when a similar prescription didn't function yeah, that was uh, kind of a surprise because as a similar believer, I told you before, <laughs> I was convinced that once you find a similar you will really happy ever after. So uh, it's not like that. <laughs> Too bad. Damn it. Yeah, damn it. Because otherwise, we could, I could say to myself, and I guess colleagues do the same, if the patient doesn't react, it's a proof that the remedy wasn't suitable, right? Yes. Yeah, so I would tell myself to look for a better remedy, and that is what I would do. While now that I learned to trust, um, let's say, the inspirations or the intuitions I have, and also if I do my consultations, and, and I'm sure your colleagues, our colleagues have this, that you are convinced this is really, really suitable in all mm -hmm. these, you know, and you might be right, yeah? you might be right, and yet the person isn't better. Yeah. Yes, so what could be the reasons? In the course of the past years, several answers came up because several possibilities are there. 
And one is, it's not on the level of, it's not on the vital level. The problem is not on the vital level. Okay, mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. it seems that the vital prescription won't, won't deal with it. Yeah. So the mythical thing is one explanation. Um, there could be some blockage that I don't always see reasons for, but then a, a miasmatic remedy might do the trick, which is nothing more than very classical homeopathy. If mm -hmm. it doesn't unfold as we expect it to do, you can try an ozone to get the engine started, right? Yes. Sometimes it does. Yeah. So that's something we can do. Like there might be some inherited problem in the background that is keeping the patient in place, that is preventing the case to, to get started. Another thing that I find is that we have a limited scale of potencies and we, sh we should broaden our vision and the patient would benefit by more individualizing prescriptions or advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's maybe another topic, but I <laughs> experimented uh, with m many more potencies than I used to use before because I uh -huh. the Kentian scale is enough. Well, it isn't in my uh, <laughs> experience, and I try all kinds of, or I give all kinds of potencies, mostly also based on intuition. Let's say virtually from one to 100,000. And in D potencies, in C potencies, in K potencies, in C4 and 5 potencies, in LM potencies, Fibonacci series, uh, name it. So mm -hmm. we, I think we have to fine tune. And I've seen cases where our Gantian scale didn't do much. And again, I must give the credits to one of my colleagues to whom I said, I tried all kinds of potencies and he asked, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, 3201M. And he said, you call that all potencies? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oops. <laughs> well, and he, like, ignited the idea well, that it's not all potencies. <laughs> it's all the potencies that homeopaths know about. So you limit yourself a lot. Uh -huh. Expanded the idea to now beyond the borders of common accepted potency theory, but yeah. he, that is uh, another possibility to deal with it. Like, okay, the remedy is right, it is a vital prescription, it's not, it doesn't seem to work, so we have to do, we have to change potencies and frequencies. So I would mm -hmm. now give 5C every day, 7C every day, or one higher potency and then a daily doses, which is not too original because it's done by other homeopaths for many years. But more of variation, let's say, more, more adjustment to the patient, potency-wise. And of course, it can be an emotional problem on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I wouldn't think that the vital remedy doesn't work then. I would just assume that the patient expects unwanted emotions to go away very quickly, which often they don't. Yeah. Yeah. They take a while and, you know, and, and they will... Sometimes a longer while. <laughs> sometimes a longer while. And not all patients are sticking to, with you for six months or one year and yeah. it still take so long before these unwanted emotions don't show up or not so often. Mm -hmm. So. It's not always, it's not working, but the patient tells you, you know, it's not working. Right. Um, and so that, would you also consider prescribing remedies then on other levels, as in not the vital level, but a mental level, emotional level, even um, physical level or uh, energetic level? Yes, yeah, we'll do that now. Let's say, in my uh, experience, for instance, chronic fatigue patients don't react very well to the simulator. Mm -hmm. The problem doesn't seem to be there. So, as you said, the energy level, level two, the physical, uh, the um, and 
energetic aspect of the physical body, that seems to be calling out for help first before the simulum can do something. There is just not enough energy to mm -hmm. reach the patient completely to help. You have to like cure, like fix, because often it's damaged, the, the energetic body, and feed it before something else can be achieved. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy. Um, these chronic fatigue patients, to me, uh, get sick not because of the vital uh, state. They get sick yeah. because of other reasons. <laughs> and of course, we have patients who have problems with toxicity. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm not specialized, but colleagues of mine, especially in Holland and maybe also in Germany and, and in other countries, are um, specialized in detoxification of the patient first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah which is a very sensible sens sensible thing to do if you seem to be uh, suffering because of toxins. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't say they don't have a state. Of course, everybody has a state. But the problem very often might not be situated on the vital and still calls for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes, if, if the, it, it's like if the patient comes to you and he's in an acute state, you will treat the acute. It's the same thing. What is it wants and what needs to be cured now or, or needs help now and cries out for help, you treat that first. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I'm talking of similar prescription, I'm talking of chronic states. Right, yes, yeah, of course. If a patient comes with a, a real acute, then... Uh, there is no need and probably not much help to f to look for a vital prescription there. Yeah? Very often it's not, and it's the same with chronic fatigue patients. That's, in my idea, not a chronic, uh, it is a chronic state, but it's not a vital problem. Mm. It started somewhere else. Yeah, I see. And as a result of the whole patient is miserable, but that's the same with, as we say with clinical problems. You said the last time, if your stomach is upset, upset, the whole person is miserable. Yeah, yeah. So this it's not the problem. The problem. <laughs> that's a sure mechanism. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, this would lead me to another set of questions, but I think we keep this for the next time, mm -hmm. um, which revolves around obstacles to cure. Expanding on this a bit more. Yeah. 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 And That's other ways of yeah, we probably have them more and more. But already Hanuman talked about it in his third or fourth hour is my thing, obstacles to cure. So a very important topic. Yeah, yeah. Probably um the list has gotten longer nowadays. Yeah. So um right, to sum up, then we spoke today about um you introduced your idea of what a mythical remedy is or a blockage on the mythical level of a patient and how to address this in, in case management. Um, then we spoke a little bit about what could be reasons for a similar prescription on the vital level not working. Mm -hmm. And then um, prescribing on other levels than the vital level mm -hmm. so um, yeah we keep this for next time to speak more about obstacles to cure okay that's a very good idea let's keep that for next time thank you very much anna i enjoyed it a lot like always <laughs> and see you next time bye for now see you next time bye